I think we should get started. So I want to welcome all of you to a meeting at the Crossroads. So my name is Jenny Guy. I'm the manager of program and operations here at Fire Station Artist Studios. So for those of you who don't know Fire Station, um, basically it's a residential studio center and artist resource, and it provides living and working accommodation for artists in Dublin and it's located in the northeast of the city centre. So Fire Station has been around for 27 years and it's the only example of this kind of resource in Ireland. And because Fire Station is a live and workplace, you can imagine that we've had to adapt our programme pretty significantly during COVID. So, but with that in mind, tonight marks a very special event with our evolving programme. So meeting at the crossroads is an event focused on visual art, sound arts, music and poetry presented by Warsaw based curator and art historian Stanislaw Welbel. Stanislaw will be hosting the event and he has invited Danielle Tegeder, Matthew Evan Taylor, Suzanne Walsh and Edward Etler to contribute. So tonight's event will explore practices and projects in a variety of forms, and we're gonna have a chance to hear from each of the participants. So there will be a chance for questions and discussions towards the end of the event. So please write your questions into the notes so that we can open this up when time comes. So the, the event will conclude with a special screening of a 10 minute film by Edward Etler that Stanislaw will tell us more about later. So a quick uh, introduction for Stanislaw. Stanislaw Welbel is a curator and art historian based in Warsaw. He currently works at the Austrian Cultural Forum as a visual art curator, before which he was working in the, the Zaketa National Gallery of Art, both in Warsaw. He studied art history at Warsaw University and curatorial studies at the Jagellonian, Jagellonian University in Krakow. Presently, he's finishing his PhD thesis at the Institute of Art of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Alongside this, Stas plays saxophone with the Warszawska Lubelska Orchestra Denta and Warsaw Improvisers Orchestra in, 20, uh, Orchestra. in 2019, he published a cassette with the Sara Renata label with music composed for several poems read by computer generated voices and is currently working on a sound project for the same label. We've been planning this event with Stas since last year and Stas originally came to Fire Station in 2015 through our International Curator in Residence program. He was scheduled to return to us in 2020 as the first participant in our return curator program, which gives curators a chance to reconnect with Fire Station years after their original time here. And I understand that quite a few uh, artists in Fire Station have had online studio visits with Stas in, in the past month or so. So hopefully um, he will be coming to Dublin sometime towards the end of this year. So without further ado, I really want to say thanks, a big thanks to Stas for leading this event. And thanks to Danielle, Suzanne, Matthew and Edward for contributing. And of course, thanks to everyone who's joining us this evening and it's just really exciting to have people from so many different locations and zones, time zones coming together like this. So Fire Station, on behalf of Fire Station, we're just really um, happy to be hosting the event and we're really looking forward to the new discourses that it's going to, that will come from this. So over to you Stanislaw. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, hello, all. Uh, first of all, thanks. Thank you again, Jenny, for the invitation uh, for um, organizing this uh, this event uh, tonight in Warsaw, today in Dublin, and just today in the midday in New York. We are in several uh, time zones uh, currently. Uh, I'm really happy for that. And as Jenny said, we were planning it for some time. I was so much looking forward to uh, to my revisit in Dublin, with, where I, I've already been at the fire station as a curatorial resident, uh, but this was impossible due to the COVID pandemic. But I'm really happy for this uh, for this meeting because we actually used this uh, opportunity and the strong point of connectivity that the, this recent move to the online gave us to create uh, a meeting of artists 
poets, composers, and and all the, and other practitioners from from uh, so many different different places. Uh, I would like to thanks to guests who I invited today, whom I will introduce shortly. Uh, first, thanks to uh, Daniel Tegeder, who is an artist based in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, she's uh, a visiting professor at uh, City University of New York in Lehman College, and she exhibited a lot and has a very long and rich art practice. I, I will not mention all of the names, but I'm happy to mention one, the one that we collaborated already once in the Hunter Gallery in Warsaw some time ago, so I'm happy we have another chance to, to work together. And I think this, this, uh, this format of meeting actually is great because it, it, enables to, it enables to reconnect and not establish networks and sustain uh, network that we have, which is, I think, particularly important in, in this difficult, uh, strange days of a pandemic. Mm. The thanks to Daniel goes also for the inspiration for this today's uh, meeting I'm organizing on behalf of Fire Station. Uh, I was very inspired by a program that Daniel uh, is running uh, from um, her apartment in, in Brooklyn since the first lockdowns in the beginning of pandemic, the pandemic salon, which is a gathering of different art practitioners and theoreticians and discussion on several topics. Daniel will say more about it, but I would like to say that it was an inspiration for me how to approach uh, this opportunity, uh, which was offered by Jenny to organize this meeting and to think really freely to, to, to invite um, different guests and i see also many many familiar faces of artists who i uh, met recently of artists who i've seen some time ago so i'm, I'm, I'm really really appreciate that we can meet here virtual, virtually uh, today's order of the of the event uh, as i planned it is that uh, each of of the guests of tonight's uh, program will have a 10 minutes for presentation uh, of recent projects, their practices, and um, and musical and art projects. Uh, then it will be followed by uh, some musical pieces that we we call, uh, I did with uh, with Suzanne recently. That will be that will be a musical uh, part. Then I hope, and I'm really looking forward for the questions and answers and discussion with 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 all of you and course with our um, participants and then and the event will conclude with the with the film of uh, Edward Etler who I hope will uh, join uh, this event uh, too. Um, he's currently in Tel Aviv. Um, uh, also other guests of tonight is Susan, uh, Susan Welsh who is an uh, artist, uh, poet and, and writer based in, in Dublin. Um, I also would not mention all the projects that Suzanne uh, did, uh, as they did a lot. And but I'm again happy to mention one that we already did together, a collaboration also at the Henta Gallery two years ago, and they participated in a festival which was connecting visual art and music uh, already in Warsaw some some time ago. So I'm I'm happy to to remind about that and i'm also very happy for the presence of today other guest matthew even tyler uh, who is um, a, um, a us-based composer a musician and a performer and what i also um, find very interesting this uh, tonight's event is, is focused on networks and collaborations and as i said i already collaborated with daniel and suzanne we did just recently with Suzanne, we, we did this poems, tracks, musical tracks we will be presenting. So I'm really happy that uh, to say that Daniel and Matthew also collaborate together. So I think it's just, this is this uh, mirror of, um, of collaborations that, that, that all connects, uh, connects us, even though each of us have very different practices that we will, that we will uh, hear and talk uh, more about. Mm. I would like now to pass uh, pass um, pass my voice to Daniel, but just before I will uh, I will 
um, like to thanks again to uh, to to Edward Etler, who I see that didn't connect yet, who agreed to show his movie at the end of the of these meetings, and the idea for that was to uh, also uh, connect with someone who. I recently work a lot. We are working together on a, on a, on a publication and a, and a book, uh, exchanging emails daily uh, and discussing uh, old films that he did in 60s and, 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 and 70s. So I thought it's also interesting to bring some archival footage to, to, to today's meeting, which will actually be showing a lot of very new and exciting things. So, yeah, that's uh, all for me. Uh, I'm passing my voice to passing uh, voice to Daniel. The floor is uh, yours. Thanks. I think I'm unmuted. So hello, everyone, and um, thank you so much, Sas. And I just want to thank thank you to uh, Fire Station for having us and. You know, I just think this is so exciting that we could come together through all of these time zones and um, countries. So I know like we're all, you know, coming into a year of doing this, which is kind of incredible, right? Um, but I just find it absolutely amazing that we can all have these kind of interdisciplinary conversations and I was talking with Matthew this morning and um, who you'll hear from later. And we were talking about he's, you know, all of us are doing talks around the country and around the world. And there's a fluidity in those conversations that I'm really interested to see how it's going to kind of shift the dialogue in many ways. <laughs> so with that, I'm gonna, we don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to jump in to talk about a project that um, I've been doing for the past year. And can everyone see that? Pretty much, great. So just quickly, um, you know, I come from a painting and drawing background. I usually make work about um, modernism, abstraction, architecture. Um, this is, I'm not gonna show a lot of my um, painting work, but I did wanna show one image um, and this was a show last year in Chicago. And I will say that a year ago, incredibly, like all of us, um, you know, the world locked down. I'm a professor at the City University of New York, which is uh, the biggest public university system in the United States. And I teach um, in the Bronx and we went on lockdown like everyone. And I was teaching a theory class, which was on a Saturday. And my students um, begged me, they said, please, please, can we continue? And um, I have a really interesting group. I teach, um, you know, the CUNY has, um, you know, huge numbers of people, like 17 out of the 21 students are from different countries in my class. I teach in a minority centered institution. I have a number of refugees. So my students were doubly hit in that um, they live in multi-generational housing. Um, and CUNY, um, we had the highest number of deaths out of any university system in the country. So we ended up having close to 40 deaths. So, and at that point in New York, when we went into lockdown and I said, yes, but let's change our format of class into a public forum. And hence the pandemic salon was born. So I went from this one day to this the next day. That's kind of, I think, apropos. And we opened it to the public. So my students would come on Saturdays and we, I started inviting speakers. But the very first salons were on how artists in history have navigated um, difficulties or being through pandemics or things like that. <laughs> or um, aesthetic studies on illness and, um, you know, how do you kind of continue to make work? And it grew. And I will say now that we are um, a year in and 15 salons in, and we've had over 90 speakers and we've had over 2000 people come from all over the world. So um, it is now set for every third Saturday. Um, and it is my student, but now it is quite open and we have, um, and it is centered around different topics. 
Um, and I'm gonna show you a couple clips of those, but I did just, I started thinking, what was I gonna talk about today? And I started thinking about ways that artists um, and writers and composers and poets have come together, um, you know, through history. And I just kind of um, put together a couple images. And of course, this is um, Cabaret Voltaire, um, which was known as the nightclub for the end of times. So I feel like we're in now some kind of nightclub for the end of times um, on Zoom in some ways. Um, so of course, this was founded by Hugo Ball and it was um, poetry, music, and so forth. Um, Gertrude Stein's The Salon. Um, I love that the salons for Gertrude Stein were on Saturdays. I do my salons on Saturdays. Um, I was reading a clip this morning from Gertrude Stein of how she was getting annoyed that people were driving by the house all the time and interrupting her writing. Um, so they centered it on Saturday nights and that's kind of what, um, you know, they kind of started doing events on Saturday evening so she could have her writing time. This is the Algonquin um, Round Table in New York. Of course, this is the great Dorothy Parker. This was called the 10 Year Lunch. So you could still go to the Algonquin Hotel in New York. It's actually under construction right now, um, but you can go to the Oak Room um, and see the table in the Oak Room, which is great. This is the Cedar Tavern, um, 1950s New York. This is Franz Klein, Pollock, where writers and poets would come together nightly. It is now sadly a drugstore. <laughs> Sometimes I go to that drugstore in New York and I stand there and I think of all the people who had sat in the Cedar Tavern. Um, this is Yoko Ono's loft in 1961 and 1962, which became um, one of the hotbeds for Fluxus. Um, at the height of this, there were over 200 people coming to the loft almost every single night. And, um, you know, many performances, um, happenings, um, and so forth. It's at 111 Chambers um, in New York. And I just have one more. So this is um, Judson Church, which is in downtown Manhattan. And it was a Protestant church that became the very unexpected setting um, for this kind of revolutionary dance with John Cage and Simone Forti and Rauschenberg. Um, it was called the, the Dance That Broke All Rules. And they hosted um, a number of performances and gatherings and conversations. There was a great show at MoMA last year um, on that. You can find this is one of the performances. And they famously used dancers that were not dancers or trained as dancers in many ways. Judson Church still holds um, a lot of performances to this day and is a working church as well. So with that, I'm going to go into just a little bit more on the pandemic salon. So, and I'll say most of them are on um, Vimeo, so you can find them. Um, and just some topics that we've covered is on architecture, magic, on the long winters, on hotels, secrets, illness, waiting. So things that um, connect to the salon and the, the format, um, is usually three to four speakers who do micro kind of talks for 10 minutes. And there is musicians and poetry curated around it. At the end of every salon, there's a reading of names that of people who've died of, of COVID and which sounds a little bit morbid now, but in the height of this, we had close to a thousand people a day dying in New York. Um, so, and you know, I will say that there's a, I curate them in a, a high and low format. So we've had um, incredible speakers like Lewis Hyde, who wrote um, on gifts, who's a MacArthur fellow. Then we have, um, there's a woman who spoke from the Snowflake Museum in Vermont about Bentley, who was one of the first photographers of snowflakes. Um, there's been writers, Rick Moody spoke um, and gave a reading on the last salon, which was on hotels. Um, we've done numbers of topics. So 
Um, and I just want to play a couple snippets to give you a sense, and I'll scroll through a few of them. But this was on um, anarchy. And this was at the height of we were having not only a pandemic in New York, so but we were having major riots. And um, so this was curated on three speakers who are anarchists. Um, one of them is Zoe Smudsey, who edited an anthology on Black resistance. Um, all of those speakers were amazing. And a lot of them actually had to come uh, anonymously without their locations because they were really in danger in a lot of ways and are really active um, as anarchists. But I'm going to play just a small snippet from Zoe Smudzi who talks about the Black experience and improvisation um, and resistance, really some beautiful moments in this and really about um, people coming together. So. that comes with the classical or orthodox theoretical form, this particular fixation with dogma and with method, um, a very particular use of jargon um, where repetition becomes like a ritual that's trying to summon a system or practice um, into being. Um, theorizing obviously is you know, very serious business and how could it not be serious business when the kind of future of the world is at stake, when we're trying to think ourselves out of climate catastrophe, of this pandemic crisis, of this crisis of incarceration, the ongoing crisis of indigenous genocide, the afterlife of slavery, like so, so many things that just kind of continue to compound the effects of the previous. And when we wrote our book a couple of years ago, um, William and I described um, that we described how there was a blackness to anarchism because of the exclusion um, of black people from the social contract. Um, and because black sociality as a result often has to exist outside, outside of statist or formal legal um, entities and avenues and organization. And we wrote that, you know, from slave ship and plantation rebellions during enslavement to post emancipation labor and prison camps, to Harriet Tubman's removal of enslaved people from the custody of their owners, to the creation of maroon societies in the American South. So that gives you a little bit of... Uh, Danielle, you've got one minute. Thank you. So there's a number of them online, but and again, I, I welcome you to look at them. But I did just want to mention, um, because we're going on to the amazing composer who's a great friend of mine, Matthew Evan Taylor. And Matthew and I have done a number of collaborations together. And I did want to um, just play a couple of excerpts of, from my drawings that are then curated around his music before he goes into talking about um, you know, our collaborations as well as his music. So just to kind of throw you into that, just as a touch, but. I'm just gonna play 30 seconds so you get a sense of. One second. So, you know, Matthew and I, like I said, we've done, um, he's, we've done projects where he's also used my drawings as scores. Um, we've done talks around the history of abstraction and music. So, and a number of things, he has a number of other really interesting projects, but that gives you a, a visual to some of the things he'll discuss. So thank you everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Danielle. And I, I think this uh, musical transition that was uh, 
and computer error is actually uh, someone just I've seen on a chess on a chat said it's an anarchy in, on Zoom <laughs> in a way. <laughs> it was an but anarchistic moment. No, <laughs> it's uh, also great transition uh, to jump to our next amazing guest, Matthew Evan Tyler. I'm so happy uh, you 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 joined today, and I'm so curious to 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 see what you will present. I am especially happy that I just realized that uh, the release of the Matthew's newest recording is just in, in, in three days on the 5th of March on, on iTunes and streaming platform. So it's also a great timing, I, I, I feel, uh, having you uh, precisely today uh, at the meeting. So the floor is yours. Yeah, just trying to expand my international exposure for my, uh, my albums there. Uh, thank you, Stanislaw. Thank you, uh, Fire Station, for having me. And uh, thank you, Danielle. Uh, I, I, part of the reason I'm, I'm in this is that I know Danielle and Stanislaw, I believe, met me through one of the pandemic sal salons. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of my interests in art making now uh, are kind of centered on how can I have a more complete um, artistic experience or how can I allow others to have one um, and so um, a, a great example of that was um, our work together on uh, Danielle's installation at the Carrie Segrist um, gallery in Chicago um, constellations that um, was basically me coming up with a musical vocabulary to match um, a lot of uh, Danielle's kind of uh, gestures that uh, some some that are that can be categorizable, but she has such a great way, a great facility with altering them and and having them translate into other things throughout. Um, and th those are just the kind of projects that tend to um, really stimulate my mind. Um, the, um, I'm a professor. I'm a professor at Middlebury College in Vermont, and um, one of the classes that I formed here is an improvisation class that is meant to be open to all um, all types of practitioners of creativity. So it's it's actually a meeting place for visual artists, for writers, for musicians, for actors, and for dancers. Um, and unfortunately, I'm, I don't have access to the videos of what's happened in those classes, but um, what's been really great is having these, um, you know, 18 to 22 year old students just really be given experiencing um, exchange from um, across genre lines, because one of the things that I, I really, I, I really um, am critical of, and it's it's not, I don't think it's a, a groundbreaking statement, but um, so much of our training as artists uh, is very myopic in that it, it really tries to isolate visual art in the visual art lane and music and music lane and things like that. And, um, and even if you try to put forward projects, like in a, a grad program, if you try to put forward projects so, uh, that involve other elements, you'll get pushback from the people that are running the institution. Um, and so I've, I've really, this is particularly true in music. Um, the conservatories are <laughs> very, very strict about what is proper and what isn't. Um, and so, I think my career to date has been kind of a rebellion against that. Um, and so a recent project actually um, uh, premiered right before the shutdown here in the United States is my, uh, living, my living score series, which is an installation project that um, is uh, meant to A, liberate the musical score as a uh, in Western classical music and allow it to be altered by lay people uh, so that there's no, no perceived barrier between musical creativity and actual musical skill. Um, and uh, it's also, 
as the series goes along, I'm, I'm also interested in translation and oral tradition. Um, so let me give you a give you a shot at that. So um, the way the project is set up is uh, I take a, an assortment of Lexan glass and I draw, I draw scores onto them uh, in Western classical uh, uh, format. And then we, that's my, <laughs> that's my mentor from grad school, Dorothy Hyman. Um, and we hang these uh, scores on the wall and then I write music for an ensemble. Uh, and they're going to be different, uh, different um, iterations of this. But uh, for this one, I wrote kind of an open format score where uh, the instruments are playing their parts. But then when they wrote, they'll be asked to rotate to a new panel. And they'll try to play the part as if they're reading music written specifically for their instrument. But then it changes it actually changes the, the music so that you get very, um, very interesting intervals uh, that, and unexpected uh, intervals. And so it, it, it turns into this really great kind of raucous experience. Um, so here's, here's one of the scores. And in between each performance and each rotation of, for the musicians, the uh, the audience is allowed to make alterations to the score. And then uh, hopefully people will want to just take one off the wall. And it just turns into this, the idea being that when the musicians now have, we'll go back to this last one, when the musicians now have all these extra, all this extra information to interpret on the score. What are their, what are their um, moments of interpretation? What are they going to actually uh, come, uh, going to actually do to express what's on the on the board? And so this is in a way, me kind of spreading my own process for interpreting Danielle's material to my musicians in my ensemble. Um, I also have, uh, since the, since the shutdown, I've been a lot more, um, involved with, uh, kind of internal worlds <laughs> and haven't, it, which hasn't really been expressed in a musical or in a visual way, but, um, definitely still engages with this idea of space. Um, and so I would like to, that project is my Project 39 series, which has been getting, been posted on Instagram for the past year now, over, uh, actually over a year. Um, let's see. And I'll give you a taste. The albums that Stanislav uh, mentioned actually come out of this series.
So this project uh, has been a real eye opener for me uh, where I'm, I've actually been, um, because of this kind of ritual of, of improvising and, and creating these soundscapes uh, on a nearly daily basis, I do take breaks here and there. Sometimes I'm just a little too fried to, uh, to contribute to anything, but- um, Hey, Matthew, one minute. Uh, Okay, great. All right, I'm almost done. Um, the I've I've become very um, aware of, even more deeply aware of, just kind of, especially as a black man growing up in the United States, just how fluid the idea of art was for me and for a lot of my my uh, friends. Uh, the idea that there was somehow a separation between the ex the expression of art based on whether it's sound or image was not really something that that we perceived. Uh, it was more because if you think about the rise of hip hop culture or even um, some uh, bands like uh, Parliament Funkadelic, which were very <laughs> instrumental for my upbringing, there's a very, the somehow the music and the imagery of like those, those great Afrofuturist album covers for Parliament Funkadelic, just there's no separation of those uh, or even going back as far as Sun Ra or somebody like that, right? Um, and so it's, it's been a real, um, real joy to, uh, to kind of rediscover that as a, as a uh, part of my identity, um, of course, I'm I'm I'm, I'm left out uh, without Leo Smith and his uh, Ankrasmation scores, which are beautiful if you haven't seen them. Um, it's just it's the that kind of art uh, to me. What feels like an artificial separation really is kind of uh, antithetical to my identity, both as Matthew Evan Taylor and as a, a black person. Um, and so, yeah, I will now pass it on to Suzanne, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Before we, we, uh, we jump to, to Suzanne's presentation, we will, we will play the, the poems tunes we, uh, I did uh, with Suzanne that will be a musical poetry break in, in, in our today's salon. But just referring to just what you said quickly, I, I find it it's, it's, it's really important and really resonates with how, how I feel about it as a, a person working as a visual curator, a visual art, but also a, a musician. Uh, for a few years, I was I was doing a project on on visual art and sound uh, at the Hunter Gallery with with my my colleagues from from the gallery, that were exactly um, questioning this this these divisions that that I I don't think should be there. Um, so I I find it really important, and I find that this this is somehow uh, one of the one of the topics that, that connects us all, all to today in, in, in the salon. Uh, so no more talking now for me. I will play now uh, poems. Uh, I collaborated uh, with Suzanne. Suzanne was reading the poems. I, I did the, the music. Uh, just short introduction uh, to what we'll be listening. It will be just a few minutes. We decided to choose uh, three poems uh, to present. There are a few more of them. And then if you would like, you can go to, to SoundCloud. I will just, I just put the link in, in our chat so you can, you can listen to, to more of the effects of our collaboration. Uh, but I would also like to thank, say thanks to Vary Klaffi, who I see is connected here today, who some time ago invited me uh, to collaborate for her uh, pandemic um, project, uh, which is called Isolation TV, and to contribute uh, with, uh, with these uh, poems that I started, as Jenny said, to do as um, musical samples with computer-generated voice. And, and I think it, 
it it started a few years ago me working with a computer voice and doing it on, on my own when it was actually easy to you know relatively to go to the studio invite friends vocalists musicians and do it in collaboration but i did it on my own and and then i find it really kind of unexpected that we did this collaboration uh, i did collaboration with Suzanne on that when it actually was impossible to travel impossible to be in the same studio even if you would like to so it's somehow a paradox in that which i find uh, interesting in that okay uh, i'm just uh, not talking more, but just playing the, the tunes. Mm, so first uh, one that uh, that I will play is a, is a piece by uh, Louis McNeese, A Meeting Point. And this, this text and the music for that was specifically realized during the first lockdown as a response to various invitation for isolation TV. And this version now we hear is similar music with a voice uh, of Suzanne and not a computer generated voice. So I will uh, show the text and the, and the sound. Time was away and somewhere else there were two glasses and two chairs and two people with the one pulse. Somebody stopped the moving stairs. Time was away and somewhere else and they were neither up nor down. The stream's music did not stop flowing through heather, limp and brown. Although they sat in a coffee shop and they were neither up nor down. The bell was silent in the air, holding its inverted poise between the clang and clang of flower, a brazen calyx of no noise. The bell was silent in the air. crossed the miles of sand that stretched around the cups and plates. The desert was their own. They planned to portion out the stars and dates. The camels crossed the miles of sand. Time was away in somewhere else. The waiter did not come. The clock forgot them. And the radio walls came out like water from a rock. Time was away and somewhere else. Her fingers flicked away the ash that bloomed again in tropic trees, not caring if the markets crash. If they had forests such as these. Her fingers flicked away the ash. God or whatever means the good, be praised that time can stop like this, that what the heart has understood can verify in the body's peace. God or whatever means the good, time was away and she was here and life no longer what it was. The bell was silent in the air. And all the room a glow because time was away and she was here.
Uh, okay, so uh, that was the one of the the first from the three that we we chose to to present today. Uh, another one is by Gordok Trakl. Uh, this one was uh, selected. The text was selected by Suzanne uh, uh, in response, and it was specifically done for to compose for me and recorded by Suzanne for today's uh, event. So it's a premiere uh, of this of this uh, of this track. Mm, here is the text. Dry out and sleep, the wind tears through black streets, springs blooms beckons through breaking bars, sky and night dew, and round about the stars go out. Greenish the river dusks, silver the ancient avenues and towers of the city. Oh gentle ecstasy, in the gliding boat and the dark calls of the blackbird in childhood gardens. Now the rosette in the clearings. Gravely the waters murmur, oh the moist shades of the meadow, animals striding, greenery, blossomy branches touch the crystalline brow. Shimmering rocking boat. Quiet the sun rings in rosette mists by hill. Great is the silence of the pine forest, the grave shadows by the stream. Pureness, pureness, where are the terrible paths of death, of grey stony silence, the cliffs of night, and the shadows of that peace? Radiant, sunny abyss. Sister, when I found you in a lonely clearing of the forest, and it was noon, and great the silence of animal life, white ones beneath wild oak, and silver the corn and flower, mighty to cease in the same flame in the heart. Darker the waters flow about the lovely games of the fish, hour of grieving, silent aspect of the sun. The soul is a stranger to earth. Blueness lingers in spirit above the denuded forest, and in the village, a dark bell tolls along peaceful attendance. Tranquil the myrtle flowers above the white islands of the dead. Quiet the waters ring in the afternoon's decline, and the wilderness grows green more darkly by the shore. Joy in the rosette breeze. Brother's gentle song by the evening hill. The last out of the three that we selected uh, for tonight is uh, is a poem by Wallace Stevens called uh, "Rabbit as King of the Ghosts," uh, which I I think all of the all the three texts that we selected to today they they have this quality of really rhythmic uh, texts. So I'm maybe further for discussion we can as we talk about so many of this connection. I'm also very interested in connecting text with music and 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 visual art and here is the text and here's music one minute okay one minute it's two minutes i will be one minute over you blank The difficulty to think at the end of day when the shapeless shadow covers the sun and nothing is left except light on your fur. 
There was the cat, slopping its milk all day. Fat cat, red tongue, green mind, white milk. And August, the most peaceful month. To be in the grass, in the peacefulest time, without that monument of cat, the cat forgotten in the moon. And to feel that the light is a rabbit light in which everything is meant for you and nothing need be explained. Then there is nothing to think of. It comes of itself. And east rushes west and west rushes down. No matter. The grass is full. And full of yourself. The trees around are for you. The whole of the wildness of the night is for you. A self that touches all edges. You become a self that fills the four corners of the night. The red cat hides away in the fur light. And there you are, humped high, humped up. You are humped higher and higher, black as stone. You sit with your head like a carving in space. Thank you. Mm, sorry for going a bit over time, but I, we thought that this selection of these three makes sense to present them one after another in musical and like also way how how interesting they they connect each each to each uh, each to another one. Uh, now I'm passing voice uh, voice to uh, to Suzanne, who whose uh, voice we already had. In this poems, <laughs> so it's a good introduction for Suzanne you to to please present uh, your your um, presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Dos. Um, hello to everyone. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about some things actually that I think have already come up, um, as well as a little bit about my practice. I'm uh, an artist and writer, and I think a lot of people here know me already. So love. Fire station folk around. I've been actually a resident in the fire station uh, studios myself in the past. Uh, so I, I'm actually, it goes kind of back to Matthew's point about the, the division between art, art forms. I'm completely one of those cross disciplinary difficult people. <laughs> kind of like, I kind of like that, you know, I like to make things a bit awkward. And I was actually thinking about the relationship to that in, in Ireland, where in a way, like, uh, writing and music are really more dominant or have been more dominant in some ways than visual art and growing up in the Irish countryside in a very you know traditional background didn't have any access to art um had access to traditional music and writing and I've always kind of felt like um yeah I feel like I draw on those in my art practice very much so as well as having been in bands and uh, write, publishing in the literary world but I also use music and uh, text in my art practice. So sometimes form to lectures, recitations, um, I sing and I do kind of audio performances and sometimes it goes into video or soundtracks, things like that. Um, and I sometimes write about art. I think it's kind of funny talking about music and art, writing and art seems to be contentious. I think even recently I've seen some uh, some articles somewhere like should artists write you know <laughs> it's like always really funny to me um why why wouldn't they or like especially writing about other artists uh, we're like in the literary world right 
writers write about writers all the time. I don't understand why it's a problem, but anyway, there you go. <laughs> Something I kind of always think about. So um, one of the things I was thinking about as well in my own practice was that, yeah, I'm a writer and that's a very alone thing. Um, so really during the pandemic that's gone on as, as normal. But the other part of my work, which is very performative and often collaborative, just thinking about how we're all physically separate. And I think I think most people are missing the connectivity of the art world on a physical level, you know, no matter how much of a studio artist you are. Um, and just how can I continue connecting to people? I, I see Christine Sun there somewhere is, is in the talk and we did a nice collaboration there during the winter for his project on chorus, which is still online. Um, which was involving Irish Rail and uh, lovely um, recordings that Chris made of bird, bird song during the lockdown last year. And then it played also online. It only plays from eight to nine every morning. But I also wrote a short story for his project. So that was, you know, it's nice that I can, especially with my medium of writing and recording, um, I, it, at least it makes it a little bit more doable to work with people. But I do miss. Um, performing a lot it's not the same really being on a video or something um so the project i want to talk about is a, a project i did with the model gallery in sligo they invited me to write something for their upcoming show the body electric which is going to be uh, online soon i think there's a podcast series associated with it that will be online on the 24th of march and uh, a piece by the commission by me will be online on the 7th of April. So they have this uh, exhibition from their collection um, and they asked me to choose a work to respond to and I chose a, a George A. E. Russell work and he was a painter at the, I suppose he was active at the start of the 20th century here in Dublin and I was very interested in his uh, work in spiritualism or his interest in spiritualism and he wrote a lot of spiritualist texts. So because I'm here in my uh, spooky old Georgian house I live in, <laughs> where I kind of feel like it's a bit ghosty or maybe being alone too much, um, you know, I started kind of thinking I've seen things and stuff. So I decided to do a collaboration with these uh, perceptions of these beings in this house with myself and the cat sees them, seems to see things. So I started doing a lot of automatic writing and that became a text which is going to be in relation to the, the work in the model. But then they asked me also in very short notice to like maybe a week to also create that into something else like a performance or a, an audio work. So also I created this pretty kind of strange audio version of this automatic writing. And this idea, like for me, you know, I am interested in, in what's real and what's not, but also I'm thinking a lot about disembodiment and how we are all here now together, but not together. And, uh, you know, and then here's me kind of going, yeah, this is my new band, you know, this kind of, <laughs> this kind of voices, you know, this kind of idea of like collaborating with something in my house that might not be real or it might be um, kind of deciding that they are so that people on the good side. But anyway, I'm going to give you a little sneak preview of this very weird track I've been making. It starts um, with also a quote from A. E. Russell uh, and his ideas of the uh, spirit world. Uh, Stas going to help me um, play because I was having some technical issues on my iPad. Um, so we're just going to play maybe about three, about three minutes. Stas, about three to four minutes maybe. Let's see, and I'll, I'll give you a shout. I can play now. Uh, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's the, the the track I sent you as a file. The um, mm -hmm. okay. always I'm playing. Our always is here is is the name mm -hmm. of it. I am much disposed to assert the existence of immaterial natures in the world and to place my own soul in the class of these things. It will hereafter, I know not where or when, yet be proved that the human soul stands even in this life in indissoluble connection with all immaterial natures 
in the spirit world. That it reciprocally acts on these and receives inspiration from them. Susanna, you said three minutes, yes? Yeah, yeah, all right. Um, as you can tell, it's kind of a bit on the spooky side. Uh, the text is all taken from the automatic writing, which also had some very strange kind of gr um, grammar up here uh, that seemed to kind of almost get the edge of grammar and being. So that kind of interested me, whether it's from my own brain or elsewhere. So it's sort of like I'm kind of, the audio track is almost like putting a sort of a seance into your house. It kind of escalates a little bit more. <laughs> You may or may not want to do that to yourself. But um, yeah, that's kind of what I, I've been doing. How much time do I have left there, Jenny? Well, one minute, all right. So I guess that's it. Um, yeah, I think that's that's just kind of what I'm thinking about at the moment. And I'm also thinking about just audio on its own because I think we're all looking at screens so much. And um, another work I'd made there recently was for Tolka in the winter and that's still available on their podcast series and we toyed with that being a video and eventually became just audio but I really like this idea of having audio works that just play while you're still kind of present in your own space you're not like having to look at the screen you can be looking at the window or and yet the audio is, is happening with it like I know that seems very simple from a music point of view but for me these are sort of artworks I want them to sort of yeah that you kind of are also present somehow um with them and when you're listening to them in the house. So I think that's something I'm going to continue this year rather than trying to move from performance so much into like making a video, for example. So there's the things I've been thinking about. And I guess I think I will leave it there. <laughs> Do you want me to show us show a snippet of this uh, of this yeah, project I would, you were doing? Yeah, sure, at this snippet. time. I was going to show a snippet just of a video some people may have seen this before. It's just a performance I frequently get asked to, to perform. And this was um, a version in, uh, you're talking about the the Vimeo. Yeah, uh, no, the the Tulka one that you just were talking. No, about. Uh, maybe the other one, the video. The video. Video, yeah, maybe at okay. this time. Um, yeah, and it's also this one's also through a curator actually. I met in our station, Chris Diddle. Uh, it's a long performance, fifteen minutes, so that you can kind of maybe just jump to a few different bits. Um, it's for this post opera exhibition I was taking part in. I was talking about playing, and it's progression from singing with a loop. I'm using a loop pedal. Just just play it stand because because um I can talk. Um it starts with a more regular singing and eventually it moves to sort of a I suppose a lack of human vocalization or a perception of being like less human. So it moves with loops. If you want to jump through a couple of times, 
Okay. Um, you get an idea as it's the progression. If you jump in again, you'll get it a different flavor. <laughs> Yeah, if you want to go in further. <laughs> okay, I will just yeah. make another jump. Yeah. And let's make two more jumps. Yeah, and then. Yeah, and The end. <laughs> <laughs> so it's too, too yeah, jump too fast. Another flavor of things I get up to. Thank you. Uh, okay, so that was the uh, the last of today's presentations. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Daniel, Susan, Matthew. Uh, I would like to open it up for uh, discussions uh, and Q and A's. I have some I have some questions uh, prepared, uh, and I really wanted to ask uh, our guests. Uh, but I would like to ask uh, in maybe before because I see so many uh, artists, so many practitioners that joined us today. That maybe we we skip my talking and we just jump into your comments and questions to to our mm, uh, participants of today's uh, salon. So. I open up the, the, the discussion. You can just unmute yourself and, and talk. One, one can do. Okay, I'll ask a question if I can. Yeah. Um, I, was just, I think you kind of answered it in part. This is to you and Suzanne. And it was about uh, your first three pieces where you had the text and the composition together. And um, I was just wondering about how, what you think of the part the text plays when people are either watching it or listening to it? Or does it play a part? Just the actual words on the screen? Yeah, I, we were discussing it uh, quickly before today's event, if we should show text uh, uh, of the poems or just uh, play the, the music and the sound. I decided at the end to show the text, mainly because sometimes there are like problems with connection and this is a meeting okay. on Zoom. So somehow things might got not lost in translation, but might get lost on, in connections. So that was just out of practical reasons. Ideally, I would prefer to have this work uh, to present it, you know, as a, as a musical piece, like on a, as a record, or, the, or you listen it on the radio or on a stereo or headphones without looking on the text. I mean, the text yeah. could be there, like it usually is on the cover of albums, uh, record albums, uh, I mean, the, the old ones before the, the digital mm -hmm. times. So that, that's how I imagine it. So that, mm -hmm. that was a, like not a curatorial choice, but just a practical choice tonight. But what do you think about that, Susan? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I understand why I did it, and I did actually say to you as well about accessibility um, mm -hmm. possibilities, but otherwise I would also be not, I would be mainly against having the text, because I think, I always think people will just read it, you know, like you can't help but like read the text and you're running ahead and, you know, I think, yeah, yeah. exactly. ideally yeah. I don't think you would be having it there. It's, um, I think it's just a, a thing that your brain wants to do. I it's thought a, you were doing it purposefully, you were kind of doing that as a, a kind of a, little <laughs> thank you 
I had a question actually. Um, uh, thanks to everyone. These are really wonderful presentations. But I had a question for Matthew actually, because um, you described the potential of the improvisation class that you're running um, with students from these many different disciplines. And so I just was wondering if you if you describe one of the, the sessions or, or hint at the dynamics that um, because it seems like a, a really important model for us all to kind of, you know, respond to and learn from. Well, so among the things uh, I among the tactics I use, I, I'll often have prompts um, and ask students to interpret the prompt based on their their discipline. So one prompt is uh, how long can you remain silent? And and it the through that prompt, uh, students are, have to kind of tackle what does it mean to be silent in your in your particular discipline. Um, uh, I think it's ostensibly it's supposed to be a music class, but I try to get students to kind of get outside of looking at me, who is most definitely a musician. I don't really do other things. Uh, but being able to convey activity and convey noise through their project, right? Uh, you know, um, it, it's interesting, like sometimes it, it's happened a couple of times where I pointed out to visual artists that there is the concept of rhythm in visual art. And like, how do you, how do you, how can you take that con conception of rhythm and turn that into meter? or something like that, right? Um, but then on our more free form days, it's just my students have spontaneously decided to engage in um, improv comedy theater <laughs> and things like that, uh, where they're kind of creating sets on the spot and stuff like that. Um, I had a couple uh, the first year I, I ran the project or ran the class, it um, we had a couple of artists who actually decided to become a collaborative team, a dancer and a, 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 a graphic designer who had gotten into live um, live animation. And so they started doing projects where they would project uh, their live animations onto a building on campus and the dancer would dance to the score as the animation evolved. So it, it's it's really been a, a, a really fun, it's it's the class that I look forward to teaching every year. Um, it's, I'm, I'm a little bummed this year because it's not going to take the shape that it normally would because of COVID restrictions, but um, uh, it's still, it turns into a really great place for the exchange of ideas and, and, and such. Cool, thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Can I ask a question? Um, hey, um, my question is for Daniel and Matthew. Um, so I've seen this uh, beautiful drawing that were um, this animation that you made and Matthew created in uh, music for, and I was uh, really interested in this piece and if you could a little, uh, talk a little bit about it, um, how you will work towards that. So what emerges first, if it's the drawing or the animation or the sound, this is um, really interesting. And then uh, for Matthew as well, um, I've seen, uh, or maybe um, there, there was like an image and um, after you screened a, a frame from your upcoming record, and it said uh, Metropolis Ensemble. Uh, if you're connected to it, I would be really interested to know a little bit more about it. So these are my two questions. Thank you. Danielle, you want to start? I'll, I'll, jump, I'll jump in and then I'll let you finish. So those animations and, you know, really um, they were existing drawings. And I'll say that, um, you know, Matthew and I have a kind of a very funny story that I had been thinking for a long time about the history between music and abstraction. And I kept thinking, you know, we're also siloed in our own visual, you know, in our own mediums. And I kept thinking, oh, I, I really need a composer. And I, funny enough, I was in a um, pizza parlor in Miami. I was at a residency and it's so funny. I was introduced to Matthew, who was on a very bad date at that time. 
And I, you know, I said, oh, I'm here from New York and I'm at this residency. And he said, I'm a composer. And I said, well, that's funny. I'm looking for a composer. And it turned into this amazing rich. We've done so many collaborations for 10 years now. <laughs> but to go back to your question, like that was um, existing drawings and it was existing music, but Matthew edited some of that music. And the drawings are then cut out digitally and they're choreographed around existing music. But the last project we did together called Constellations, which, you know, just in 10 minutes, I can't, too hard to show everything. Um, they were existing drawings, very similar to the ones kind of behind me on my wall. And then Matthew used those as scores. And they were installed site specifically in Chicago. And then Matthew came out, he actually performed them when they were on the wall. And we also gave a talk. So we've had a lot of different ways. So in the first one, they both existed. But in the second one, the drawings came first and then Matthew used them as scores. You wanna jump in, Matthew? Yeah. And, um, so how so, did you use them as scores? That's also interesting. Yeah, okay. So um, the, um, so uh, I tried to use the dimensions of the, so the, her, um, Danielle's use of space uh, as indicator of like how loud I would be. Um, the different colors would um, loosely correspond to range as far as uh, if it was a low green, that would have a green that happens in like the low left hand corner. Maybe that's a particular pitch and then I would kind of connect that to the top of that that um, that image or, or something like that. So it was, it, they a lot of times I would invent structural and kind of acoustic effects to kind of reflect what I'm seeing in the in the uh, um, drawing. And I, I'm sorry, I forgot the, the second part of your question. Regarding the Metropolis uh, Ensemble. Oh. So Metropolis Ensemble is, uh, is an, uh, a chamber orchestra based in New York uh, that's been involved in a lot of my, uh, it has been commissioning me quite a bit for the past, yeah, uh, almost 10 years now. Mm, is that right? We'll say 10 years, just, you know, uh, <laughs> the historians will, uh, will correct me. Um, and uh, they've just, they've always been um, really supportive. And for this particular project, they were the commissioners for the project. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's it. And then- uh, If you can they, link, um, a link to, in the chat to their sources, that will be wonderful. I'm yeah, really yeah. curious about oh. the work. So. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, I'll, I'll put my email. If you want something on constellations, I can send you a PDF that links to the music and the drawings as well. So let me just do that for anyone, you know. Yeah, also um, to all uh, all of us today, please make use of chat. Uh, I, as I said at the beginning, I was very inspired by pandemic salons by, by Danielle. And I learned that chat is really extremely useful tool in, in this pandemic salons on Zooms that a lot of artists and, and uh, participants of the of the salons exchange a lot of information on on the chats send links and and you know as you said now this this anecdote how you and Matthew started to work together by this coincidence serendipity whatever we might call it I hope this we can somehow recreate also on meetings like 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 tonight that uh, or today uh, and I really hope hope for that that the there might be some um, some new collaborations, contacts, and networks uh, that that new projects that emerge from uh, from today, as we so much talk about collaborations uh, today and working together on on projects. Do we have some more questions, uh, comments, contributions? Um, I could ask a quick question, and for for anybody who wants to pick it up, just because it, everybody, it's been really inspiring and um, it's been nice. Like I used to do a lot of experimental music when I was younger and it's been nice to think back to some of that and to see all the different crossovers that you guys are kind of bringing to the surface. Um, but re, you know, recently, like I've, it, and this kind of comes from teaching a bit as well and trying to talk to students about um, 
what it's like when different disciplines come together. You know, how it's not always like an equal exchange. Sometimes there's one thing that can be more dominant or like, you know, people, people who are working in one discipline have like a way of, um, a way of working that can be hard to, or maybe I shouldn't say hard, but it can be kind of a, a challenge to, to, to become part of or to, you know, to interface with. And I was just wondering if, if any of you guys have any comments about like the kind of frictions that can happen when you're, when you're working to bring things together um, that can be productive or, um, you know, sometimes repulsive or whatever, but I'm just curious if anybody has any, any thoughts on that. Just thinking of the crossroads kind of thing. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead, Suzanne. Oh no, I, I was just I was just thinking about back when I when I used to be in bands and, and the only time thing come to mind is when I used, was playing with you know classically trained people who'd be like, you can't do that. <laughs> but I don't think I really play very often classically trained people. So, but it was just that sort of like horror or something. But then we all became around in the end. Anyway. Yeah. Well, I find it Matthew, you wanna go? Yeah. Um I got um for me with collaborations, I've, I've been lucky. I, I haven't really had to deal with a lot of tension, uh, but uh, one that I find that's really interesting um, that I've come in contact with, and especially with dancers, um, sometimes with visual artists, is the is the division of time, um, and and what it what exactly it means. Uh, for a musician to be in a place for a long time versus a visual artist or a dancer. Um, so a, a good example of that is uh, a dear friend of mine, actually from Miami, uh, and I collaborated on my on my ballet. Um, this was back in 2013, and I I was willing to be there all the time and working with the dancers and stuff like that. But then when I hired the musicians, musicians had the music which they learned overnight, you know? And so for them, their time was very precious. And I was like, I can't pay them enough for them to stay with, it. whereas with dancers, obviously they don't have a score. They're having to learn it and get muscle memory for that. And so that kind of tension is uh, really interesting. And it, it um, it's, it's inspiring when it's on the artistic side, but it's, frustrating when it's on the logistics side, right? Um, and then another thing that I thought about that's really interesting to me is conception of space as far as a, necess a necessity. So like for me as a musician, space is a necessity, but I don't have, I, I can't, if it's not freestanding space, that's a limited kind of necessity. Whereas if you're, meaning I have to be cognizant of who's around me in order to operate fully, right? Whereas with visual arts, you kind of have that, but space is kind of a given in your practice. Like you, you one of the first things you have to take into account is where am I going to do this? Whereas with music, I don't have to think about that first. I, it's just an eventual concern. So those kind of uh, structural things are really interesting and, and do cause like misunderstanding from time to time. Yeah, but they, they come out, I, obviously like when you work through it, like you have, you you bring that understanding to another collaboration. Right, exactly, people. yeah. Especially when you're involving other people, like you were saying about all the labor that goes into it. I mean, that's so, that's that's quite inspiring. Um, and I have a question for you. Were you, did you ask your question in regards to teaching? Did I? A, li a little bit, just because I think I, I did a course recently with some students here called Architecture from the Outside, and it was it was trying to get their heads around like kind of coming up against a discipline that can be sometimes assertive in different ways. And, you know, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. And, you know, Matthew and I, we were also kind of spoke about teaching and, um, yeah. you know, Jenny um, just put out this amazing book, it looks like on curriculum, which I'm completely fascinated by. And you know, I think it just, you know, it really, um, it looks great. And it, I think it really goes into, you know, when I, the pandemic salon came out of teaching and um, it was like the first time that I started bringing musicians and people like that into my teaching because the fluidity of being online allowed that. But when you are siloed in institutions, it's very difficult to do that. And I, 
you know, I teach with great musicians at CUNY and we don't even know one another or the writers. And I find that's probably the same in many places. And, you know, just looking at some of the inspiring teaching, like a lot of, you know, like John Cage's class, which was at the new school that inspired like the Judson Church and tons of other, I mean, I find that really interesting of how to create that dialogue you know, at the center of like curriculum in some ways. And I think Matthew's class is completely fascinating, you know, in that regards and the pandemic salon, how it really, it's the first time community really came out of my teaching in some ways and bringing in that kind of dialogue, you know, in a sense and cross kind of talk, which I think is very hard to do, you know, in general, so. I just have something to add actually. Um, I think for me, it's more institutions maybe um, or maybe curators sometimes say in relation to performance. I think um, maybe like often performances, say art performances, uh, get asked, you get asked a lot at the openings of exhibitions or, you know, it's sort of supplementary in some way or to respond to. And I find, you know, I'm always trying to push to just be another artwork, you know what I mean, in relation to something else. <laughs> That's how I kind of see myself. Um, you know, I, I, I I've heard other people who perform that way too sometimes. I think it's not really still, and that happens a little bit with writing too. I think it's still sort of seen as a material that is in response to rather than a standalone thing. I mean, this is from the art world point of view, I suppose. And that's what's kind of freeing sometimes just doing writing within the literary world, then it's just its own thing. So for me, that's kind of interesting to think about sometimes, you know? Yeah, uh, to build on that, the, another from the institutional standpoint, um, another thing that can happen is, uh, I remember I, I did a, a residency in the Southern United States where um, clearly it, it had been designed by people that only really considered writing and visual art. And so when I came in, they, they had just all these questions that were just wrong for how a musician thinks, <laughs> right? Uh, and so there, there was a real need for kind of like a Rosetta Stone of uh, to translate what the what the demands were for for uh, the project um, and but uh, you know eventually what happened actually was the the first roots of the living score that I was talking about um, I had to figure out how because essentially what what I needed to do was become an installation artist in order to kind of satisfy the 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 needs of the of the of the residency and uh and so i was like okay here we go <laughs> so like that was the inspiring part of it uh it was definitely very frustrating at the very um very beginning but uh it definitely led to some really fruitful directions for me and i think just you know visual arts are really lagging lagging behind on this and now that we've moved into social practice and so much crossover in different ways and you know, I just find like, you know, musicians know that they play in a band and they can be pulled down or pulled up and visual artists actually don't know that in a lot of ways. They're alone. So like when we collaborate, it's like, I mean, I got so lucky with Matthew and then I've gone on to so many, so many other collaborations where there's been real challenges. <laughs> right? And so, but you know, musicians inherently know that. And, you know, and I think as painters or people like that in some ways, you know, that's a real learning curve and that's not in the curriculum and in institutions in any there's, way. And there's no form for that. There's no, there's form, no form for it. Visual artists to, to like combine in real time and lose your voice and your body in the way that you do with music yeah. or dance maybe maybe with that we're just not trained for it mm -hmm. and we we should be in some ways in collaboration in um you know i almost feel like you should be trained as almost like a social worker or, or as an anthropologist what does it mean to go into other communities as well you know it's like now artists are doing that but that's not part of their training either you know so yeah so there's a lot missing for sure and just to like add uh, also something on, on Sven's question. Thanks, for, thanks for that. I find it really important and interesting, and it pushed our discussion in really interesting areas. But I will answer not from like academic or teaching experience, more from like performance, uh, performing experience. Uh, I'm I am a member of two orchestras, two very different ones. One is a Warsaw Improvisers Orchestra, which is modeled after like London Improvisers Orchestra and, and other ones that like in, in major cities, 
we play improvised music, I play saxophone with uh, conductors and we interpret the language gesture of the conductor into improvised music. And there is like a round of group of around like 50, 40 musicians around the orchestra. There is like a, let's say, a hardcore of the orchestra and like satellite musicians. Now we don't play, obviously for the one year because of pandemic, this music is really difficult to kind of put on Zoom. Uh, but what I wanted to say, going to, to Sven's questions, like that this group of, of musicians active in Warsaw Improvisers Committee and, and Orchestra are actually having a lot of collaborations with visual artists. They are very well connected to visual art. So I collaborated with some of my colleagues from the orchestra on some like art projects in, in the gallery. And I play in another orchestra, which is the um, the Warsaw, Lublin, Brass Band, Brass and Woodwind Orchestra, which plays a traditional music from east part of Poland, like music from end of 19th century and from the interwar period, that is basically like a musical archaeology. A, a chief, a band leader of our band travels in east part of, of Poland and south, gathers uh, folk music, traditional music from that area, records them, writes it down, and we learn to play this traditional music of generation of musicians that are now going away as we see it, because it's usually old people and they don't have like natural successors because people moved from the villages to the cities. So we somehow are a group of people in, in, in Warsaw playing this music from the East. And this is like really traditional tunes. But again, how it connects to Swan's question, because you ask about tensions, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I was so surprised when I, when I started to, to play the longer and understand these environments that the most tensions are between actually these musicians from these two different musical scenes. So uh, the, the people connected to the traditional brass and woodwind music, they also are very well connected to the output. But those two Warsaw based orchestras are totally not connected to each other. Like I'm the now I'm the second, there are only two members of the orchestra besides me and my colleague who are members of them too. I brought the other one. And it usually happens that when, when people started because of me to go to each other concerts, they were like absolutely like, wow, you can't do it. You can't play like that. And on the improvisers and when the improvising people came to the traditional music, they were just blown away saying like, wow, this traditional music is so hypnotic. It's like so, you know, it's 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 a trance music almost, just traditional brass, brass music. So I think that a lot of tensions are also between the several niches of the of, of this kind of cat of the specific disciplines. And and I've seen that what I was trying to do that to connect the, the this these two uh, two areas uh, as well. And I didn't see that many many clashes between yeah as i said visual artists and then and the experimental musicians and i guess maybe it's also like the the experience that that you Matthew, you shared that the experimental musicians musicians connecting to impro playing and performing improvised music are usually i mean at least it's on the polish art scene so very well connected to the art world let's say yeah uh, I just want to also bring up, uh, I'm in Amsterdam art scene, so, and I'm, but I'm also connected to the Polish one. <laughs> and um, I also noticed that a lot of visual artists uh, are working with sound. It's of course not comparable to the practice of being a musician, trained musician with this like long life practice of performing. And, but um, I sense maybe because of the influence of the performance scene, uh, there's more and more uh, artists who are um, trained as painters or sculptors who are just like reaching out for more um, for forms of uh, more like active spectatorship like I'm a filmmaker I'm trained I'm trained as a filmmaker but I perform films and I create installations uh, that are meant to engage the audiences so I do work with sound a lot actually um, and I feel like uh, also as an inter like becoming an interdisciplinary artist as my career kind of um, follows, I see that there, there aren't many artists that are dedicated to one practice anymore <laughs> around me, you know, like um, 
it does seem like uh, collaborative uh, way of uh, working is growing strong and even if uh, traditional art schools are still training uh, people to be, be one man's orchestra, <laughs> uh, talented uh, guru, it doesn't necessarily um, come out like this anymore, other, other than in the context of being a gallery collectible artist. Um, that's just what I wanted to, to say. As I see it through the practice, it's actually more familiar to me to be taking from both experiments in music and improvisation and also a lot of visual artists are actually musicians also and the other way around so yeah it's just, just what I what my thought about it was just like yeah why not say in practice it actually isn't anymore a deviation <laughs> It's like earlier on, Jenny and I were talking about it and we're, you know, this like the idea of like meeting at the crossroads, it like implies that, you know, like what happens at the crossroad, you have to go away from it or you cross over. But it seems like, like you were saying that Julia, like so many of us are, and everybody who's presenting tonight is like kind of holding these things together, you know, so it's not, is it still a crossroads if it's, if it's maintained over time, does it still feel like an intersection or is it just natural? Like you were just implying, it's definitely a question. I mean, I think it's just, it's interesting to look historically at schools like that have done that, like Black Mountain, or a lot of my professors came out of Cal Arts in the late 60s. And the backlash against that is that um, it was this kind of amazingly rich few years, and then there was no structure, and then kind of everything went awry. And the backlash when they came back to teach in art school was like foundations and structure and craft and siloing. So it's interesting to look at those moments and then see kind of what happens after um, as well, you know? So I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> I don't know what the answer is either, but uh, <laughs> I think that will be maybe around talking about the crossroads to go to another crossroad and to, to jump into, into the movie that I also wanted to screen for all of you tonight. Uh, just before we do that, I'll just quickly introduce the, the film and, and the director. After the movie that will, the, our meeting will, uh, will, will go to its end, but I hope it will not be an end of our conversations and I hope for like future collaborations and I hope this will be a maybe starting point for for the new project. Uh, I selected this, uh, this movie, uh, as Jenny said, we, we, we started to think about this meeting already a few months ago. It was still a very frosty and snowy wind, uh, winter in, in Poland. And we were in uh, lockdown. I was dreaming about going uh, to the mountains, uh, which I uh, love to go in winter. And, you know, after this like year of being home, I really was, was dreaming about it. And I recalled the movie that I've seen some time ago by, by Edward Rettler, who couldn't join us today, but I see Hagit is there. So maybe uh, it's uh, Edward's partner. So maybe they're watching uh, together on Zoom. Uh, Edward is, um, is a di director who um, finished a Polish, uh, one of the most famous Polish films, film schools, the film school in Łódź. He, he worked until uh, 68 on mostly on short movies, uh, got some international prizes, but then because of the political events, he was forced to uh, leave Poland and emigrate. Now he lives between Israel, uh, Tel Aviv and, and Poland. Mm. I selected this movie just intuitively because it has some qualities that, that, that spoke to me uh, this image of the mountains, the image of isolation. The film was shot in, in south, of, south of Poland, in Zakopane, where it, where it is still till today the biggest hospital uh, for tuberculosis patients. The building is still there. It was a, a huge uh, center for treatment tuberculosis starting from 19th century. So the, whole, the film is inspired by uh, Thomas Mann, um, The Magic Mountain. And, 
what I what I also found really interesting in this film that that's why I propose it for today, and that's what Edward asked me to say because we exchange emails. Um, when I asked him how you would like me to introduce the film, and he said, you know, you should tell one thing that I always make films, I always made films with film composers. Uh, Edward was working with Krzysztof Komeda, who is a, a giant of uh, poly jazz scene uh, and, and composer for film music. He composed um, like Oscar winning uh, music soundtracks for films like Rosemary's Baby and, and, uh, and others. He died tra tragically in, in, in Los Angeles. And uh, Edward said that when Krzysztof died and couldn't make more music for his films anymore, he, he couldn't make films anymore. That was out of a sudden really difficult because the music was making his, his movies. That, so I thought that this is actually very good sum up also for uh, today's uh, discussion on the crossroads and on inspirations between, between the, the disciplines soundtrack for uh, White Vals was uh, not composed by, by Krzysztof uh, Komeda, but was heavily inspired by him and done also in close collaboration with uh, poly jazz uh, musicians. Mm. And what I also thought, I mean, what I really like about Pandemic Salons and these meetings today is that this gives us this glimpse a little bit of optimism in these strange days that we live through. But as Danielle said, and I've, I participated in, in several pandemic salons, it's always very emotional moment when the list of the names of people who died for COVID is, is being read at the end. It, it's, it's really a, like very special moment. So I thought also this film somehow uh, resonates with that. It's, it's a moment also on reflection on what times are we in and uh, what are we going through? Because the film, the, 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 the people are, the, the protagonists are um, in confinement in, in, a, in a sanatorium for uh, infectious disease uh, in that film. What I also found really important in that film, that is, uh, and this is the case of most Edward Etler's films, that he makes films without dialogue. So it's really possible to show it into international audience like we have today. And one doesn't have to worry about subtitles, about translations, because this is almost like a silent movie, but with, with music. So I find it also really inspiring here that there is a language and communication between the protagonist of the film, but without words. So yeah, without more talking on my side, I will jump to film. To the movie it has it is 10 minutes long Okay, can you see?